Welcome to the 1 p.m. service. Yeah, look at all these people here at 1 o'clock. Man, this is great. You know, this has been quite an amazing day already. Um, just the presence of God and the impact that that has had on people. And um, I'm very excited. I agree with Julian that you came to the right service. And we're just believing for the fullness of God's spirit to impact you this afternoon. Anybody agree with that? I want to pray as we get started, but I want to read to you the lyrics of one of our praise songs that we sang. And um, that's what, this is what I've been praying, and this is how, what I prepared in this message. But we sang, Spirit come, Spirit come, pour it out, let your love run over, here and now. I think that's so powerful. And it's amazing how in our humanity, it's so easy for us to fall into patterns or habits and we could be singing here and now and not, not really expecting anything. We're, we're thinking about great times we had before or great times in the future, but we're singing here and now. We're like believing God right now that he's gonna pour out his spirit. And it says, uh, tongues of fire, testifying of the sun, one desire, Spirit come. It says, speak revival, prophesy like it is done. Spirit come. That's what we're praying. So you sang it. I'm going to catch up with you in prayer. God, thank you for your Holy Spirit's presence here. And I pray that revival would break out in the one o'clock service today, here and now. And I pray that all things done here would bring glory to Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray, amen. So what's going to happen here is that I'm going to bring a message to you. Let me back up. I'm going to give this amazing sermon <laughs> that you guys are just going to be so verbal. I can hardly finish. And uh, then we're going to receive communion as part of my sermon. That's, not, that's part two to the sermon. And then we're going to pray for healing and I want you to, I'm telling you that so that you could be expectant. I want you to listen to the things that I'm saying and see what the Holy Spirit might be saying to you. Because in the first two services, um, we saw many people healed. We um, talked to people. We saw people healed of spine problems, back problems. Um, somebody with arthritis in their hands were in pain when they came in and it was gone. And, and so many things that have happened today, and I believe 1 p.m. is special, so there could be more. So um, to start my sermon, I want to tell you, I don't normally tell jokes. I usually hope that humor will emerge just naturally as I'm talking with you, but today, I tested this out in the other two services, and they agreed that I should uh, tell you this. <laughs> a man is in a men's locker room with several men sitting around him. The cell phone rings, and he uh, picks up the phone and puts, clicks on speaker. And the man says, hello. And the woman on the phone says, hi, honey, it's me. Are you at the club? And the man says, yes. She said, I'm at the mall, and uh, I just saw this beautiful leather coat. It cost about $2,000. And before I purchased it, I just wanted to see if you're okay with it. Do you mind if I buy it? And the man said, sure. And she said, oh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I thought that's what you would say. And, uh, and by the way, I stopped by the car dealership and saw one I really liked, and he offered me a good deal. Can I go ahead and buy it? And the man said, how much? She said, 90,000. And he said, well, if it's that much, make sure it has all the features that you want, and then go ahead, you can get it. And she said, oh, thank you, I, I really appreciate that. And one more thing, um, uh, I just finished talking to my friend, and the house that we wanted is back on the market. 
and they're asking 1.8 million. Can we go ahead and make an offer? And the man said, okay, um, make an offer for 1.5, and then if they don't accept that, then you can move up to you know, what they'll accept. And the woman said, thank you so much, honey, I love you, bye. The man says, love you too, bye. And the man hung up, and everyone in the locker room was staring at him amazed. And then he held up the phone and said, does anybody know whose phone this is? <laughs> <laughs> See, no extra charge for that. <laughs> Spiritually speaking, we have to know how to discern God's voice. And uh, I know I'm stretching here, but we don't want to make up God's voice. We don't want to get bored waiting to hear him and make up our own thing. Anyway, during our legacy nights, one of our speakers, Priscilla Shire, told an amazing story, and I want to repeat it today, and maybe you didn't get a chance to hear it, but if you did, it's a great reminder because it's very crucial to what I'm talking to you about today, and my message is about the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, and healing. And what she told about was in the 1940s in England, there was a professor, Dr. Orr, who ended up being a, an expert on historical revivals. But he was teaching in a, a Bible school, and he had theology students that he was teaching. And in England, there are a lot of sites where there were great leaders in the church that led reformations and led movements of God. And so he got all the students in a bus and they drove around one day on a field trip to look at some of the locations of where somebody was born or where this event took place, that church, you know. And they went to a place where John Wesley uh, preached and right next to it where he lived. And they had preserved the place where he lived. Now, John Wesley was a powerful leader in the body of Christ. And he was a key leader in bringing the message of grace. Because many people struggled under this idea that if I'm good enough, I can earn salvation. John Wesley brought an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit and reaching people that no one could reach. So they took the students to the house and they showed the kitchen where he might have had his meals and in the living room where he might have relaxed and they went into his study where uh, there were many books on the shelves and where he would have prepared his sermons and uh, where he would have studied. And, and they went up to the bedroom. The bedroom was a small bedroom, a small bed there, but um, they were talking about it. The students um, encircled the bed and the professor pointed out that there were two marks in the carpet right next to the side of the bed, and they were places that they had preserved because this is where John Wesley had worn patches in the carpet because he would kneel by the bed and pray. And he would pray for an outpouring of God's spirit and not just a casual prayer before he went to bed, but he literally spent hours in prayer by the bed and his knees would wear um, over the years these, these uh, marks. And so the professor talked about that, and then they concluded that, and they all loaded everybody back on the bus. And when they did a head count, one was missing. And so the professor went back in the house, and he looked in the kitchen, looked in the living room and the study, and didn't find anybody. And he went into the bedroom, and he found one student, a young man, and he was kneeling in those marks. He put his knees where John Wesley's knees were, and he heard him pray, Lord, do it again and do it in me. Lord, do it again and do it in me. And when the man finished praying, he said, come on, we need to go. And so he walked Billy Graham back to the bus so they could get him. And I, I hope and pray that this becomes our prayer as a church, our prayer as individuals and leaders that we're saying with an expectation and faith, Lord, do it again. Do it in me. Do it again. And that's what this message is about because 
we've been talking about and we've been praying and expecting revival. And revival is throughout the plan of God. We read about revivals in the Old Testament where cities and nations would turn from their sin and turn to God and there would just be a blessing of God that would go through the people. There were revivals in the New Testament and there were revivals in contemporary history in our church. And there was one revival called the Welsh Revival that began in Wales, you're welcome. And uh, it was in 1904, and um, that Welsh revival blew up, and at, uh, revival historians say at least 30 other outpourings or revivals took place out of connection with that revival. The man leading that was named Evan Roberts, which you may have heard about, but one of the revivals that birthed out of that was in Los Angeles, 1906, Azusa Street Revival. And it's reported that maybe 600 million people who would say and identify themselves as spirit-filled Pentecostal people came from those moves of the Holy Spirit. And so when we talk about revival, that's what we're talking about. One historian defined revival as this, an incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit that touches not only the church, but people outside the church. I have a definition, and that is the continual flow of blessing and breakthrough beyond the normal that exceeds our efforts. It's like we serve in the same passion, but there's an additional blessing of God the fruit of our work, the fruit of our prayer is greater than the efforts of our prayer. It's like God breathed on what was taking place and more people came into a relationship with Christ. One of the things I've noticed in the revival that I was involved in in the 1970s was that people would show up to church early. Yeah, they would show up not because they were told to, but because they were anticipating the presence of God. And what was happening is that the seats were filling up and they didn't want to miss out. They didn't want to miss out on anything the Holy Spirit was doing and they didn't want to not get in. And so you could all show up on time, but the issue is, is God's presence here. That's what we're going for. We're, we're praying about the intensity of God's presence in our church. I love this scripture that makes me think of an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, and it's in Romans chapter 10 and verse 20. And he's quoting Isaiah, and Isaiah's prophesying and saying, this is what God said, I was found by those who did not seek me. I, was, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. That is a special grace. It's like those people that you love that say, I don't want anything to do with it. And in the revival outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they might still say it, but then in the next minute, they're crying and going, oh, I need God. Because people don't want religion and they don't necessarily want church unless it's marked by the presence of God. The presence of God answers questions that we don't know how to articulate. It answers questions, it answers doubts, it removes fear. God's holy, divine presence. Everything that we read about, everything that we believe and are promised is fulfilled in God's presence. I read or I heard a definition of the term wilderness and I thought it was interesting because it talked about a barren place and also a place of uncertainty. I would think that Los Angeles would qualify as a wilderness spiritually, that there's a lot of darkness, that there's a lot of barrenness spiritually in people's lives, and there's a lot of uncertainty. But when God's presence is poured out, when we are walking in his presence, our life becomes flourishing and full of uh, great fruit that God promises our life. In Exodus 33, Moses 
talks to God, and Moses was leading the people out of captivity, and he was leading them into the place of God's promise, and God told him, here's what I want you to do next. And in Exodus 33, um, in verse 15 and 16, it says, Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, God, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and on your people if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. He was so aware of the presence of God and what a difference that made. And that's why Jesus died and rose again so that that veil of separation between the people and God's presence in the temple would be torn apart and that you and I would have access to God's presence. And what we want is not a church service. I hope that we all get ruined by a sense of revival, by we don't want to go to church, we don't want to have religion, we want to encounter the presence of God like never before. When the Holy Spirit is recognized and experienced, it impacts our bodies, it impacts our soul, it impacts our mind, their spiritual renewal. If Jesus walked in this room right now in human form and we were all aware it was him, we, we would say, Jesus is here. Wow, this is amazing. Something, what's going to happen? Faith would shoot up in the air. You know, and Jesus said to his disciples, it's better for you if I go away and I send the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is here. And I pray that God opens our eyes and opens our hearts so that we'll have the same reaction to that revelation that the Spirit of God is here. When we say, the Holy Spirit is here, we say, wow, what's going to happen? Anything could happen. Your, your uh, deepest dream, your greatest fears, your healing, your freedom, your deliverance would be manifested because of God's presence in this place. Thank you for those of you who are clapping. I'm going to just keep preaching until all of you go, wow, let's have it. And so, uh, but here's what, we, we had these legacy nights, and I'm telling you, in 34 years of ministry, there was never any series of nights like this in our church history. And so, what I recognize is there's a timing, and there's an, a leading of the Holy Spirit, and, and today, I'm preaching, and Possibly, you know, 2,000 plus people have heard me talk about the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you that 33 years ago, I preached on the same thing to 20 people. And I'm still believing. <laughs> David said, one thing I ask from the Lord this only do I seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. One thing I seek, he said. When the scripture talks about, I was glad when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord, he wasn't saying, I was glad when they said, it's time to go to church. The house of the Lord is the place where God's presence is. And David was saying, oh, I want to go to God's presence. He was saying in this scripture, one thing I seek, that I could dwell in the house where God lives. That's what we're praying for. That's what we're believing as we pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a revival. We're praying for the manifested presence of the Holy Spirit without measure. I think sometimes... We get confused and we, we want the power, we want manifestations, but there's an intimacy to it. And I was thinking recently, because I heard somebody say, sometimes leaders want the presence of God so that they'll have power when they minister, rather than wanting the presence of God for intimacy. And then, as some teachers do, 
throw the little dagger in there. It's like, so when you fall into that trap, you're wanting intimacy for profession, not intimacy for relationship. And he goes, and you know what we say about people who have the profession for intimacy? I was like, oh God. I want your presence because I want you. So we're trying to take what we tasted of in those legacy nights here. And it's one thing to have a night, one service in a night. You've got time to interpret what God is doing. You've got time to make room for the spirit to touch people and for people to understand what's going on. But on a Sunday, you've got three services in a row and you've got to keep going. But we, we've done something today and we want to keep doing this. But what we've begun to do is try to expand the time we have in worship so that we're not just doing X number of songs, moving on to the next thing, but trying to shorten what we say in between with information and get to the message and allow time to pray with people so that we can help people have that encounter with the presence of God. So I want to read to you three or four scriptures in the book of Acts, and I'm not really going to teach on those verses, but some of you may have read this before or heard me talk about it, some of you maybe not. But in Acts chapter 2, this is when the New Testament outpouring of the Holy Spirit started, when what we call the New Testament church began. The Holy Spirit fell and filled people, and there were 3,000 people saved in that one encounter, and the church launched and reached thousands of people. But I want to show you something that's important for us to recognize. And so there are three things that happen. The Holy Spirit filled the house. Then the Holy Spirit filled the disciples. Then the Holy Spirit spilled out into the community. I've read this portion hundreds of times, and I didn't see that distinction until this year. And I'll show you what I mean. In Acts chapter 2, verse 2, it says, Suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. I just thought it filled everybody, but it filled the house. <laughs> then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the second thing that happened and, and where they were sitting. And then... Um, verse 5, at that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. So pause that for a sidebar. What that means is it was the feast. The Jewish people had several feasts and pe during the year, and people would come from all over, and this was the feast of Pentecost. And so people came from all over to Jerusalem. God has a timing that he moves and has reasons for it. But then, so there are all these people there, and then look what it says in verse 6. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were be bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. And so it continues to describe the different things that took place. But it shows you that pattern. The Holy Spirit filled the house. Then the Holy Spirit filled individuals. And then it spilled out into the streets and to the community. And that's what I'm praying happens at Oasis, that the Holy Spirit's presence would be felt here, would be recognized, that he would fill this house, and that each one of you would be filled with the Holy Spirit, that you would have a new encounter with God. You would be empowered by his Spirit, and that what God begins here pours out into the community, and that you take with you a compassion for people, a faith to, to pray for miracles and healing and, and help people set, be set free. There's something special about when God's people come together. There is an intensity in God's presence, but this is not the only place. This is like the locker room meeting before we go out and do life. It's like we worship God, we get filled with faith, we empower, then we go out and we pray with people, talk to people and allow the Holy Spirit to use us in powerful ways. I heard somebody say 
the, we often, Christians, relate the Holy Spirit to a dove. Simply, it was just described that as a dove descended, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus when he was baptized. But that's in our mind. So he said, so what if a real dove landed on my shoulder and I wanted that dove to stay there and not be startled or fly away? He said, so my every movement would be made with the dove in mind. Maybe that's a transformation that you and I can go through, is that we make every movement with the presence of God in mind. It's what I'm doing, helping bring people into the presence of God. How can I help? What am I doing that might hinder? Lord, I want to honor you. I want to honor the Holy Spirit in my life. Here's what you need to know. The Holy Spirit is in me for my sake. The Holy Spirit is on me for your sake. Each of you, the Holy Spirit is in you for your sake so that you can have wisdom, you can have peace, you can have clarity, power. But the Holy Spirit is upon you for the others in your life, for their sake. And this is that encounter we're talking about is having the power of God's presence in our life. In the book of Acts, Peter had said there were unusual miracles that took place. I'm, I'm believing God for unusual miracles. I'm, I'm kind of targeting any miracles, but unusual would be great. But it says that he walked along and his shadow fell on people and they were healed. How is that possible? A, sh a shadow has no substance. How would somebody know that was on? Maybe it's whatever overshadows us, impacts others. So we say, Holy Spirit, come. Fill me. Come upon me. Let me live my life with the Spirit of God in mind so I can be a part of this outpouring of God. I can be a part of this revival, be a significant part in bringing God's touch to people. I love to just bring up this one point and then we're going to uh, receive communion. But in, that, in the book of Acts, in that portion of scripture, a few verses later, it's in uh, verse 12. It said, they stood there amazed and perplexed as the crowd. What does this mean? Amazed is, wow, this is great. Perplexed is, but what are those people doing? This is awesome, but those people, are they drunk? <laughs> you know, when the Holy Spirit touches human flesh, sometimes we just can't take it. People laugh, people cry, people fall over, people dance, whatever they might do. But here's the trick is we want to be naturally supernatural. Where things get weird is when our focus is on the manifestation not his presence. So if we had an experience with God and we cried and we want to have another experience with God, may we start crying to kind of get him going? It didn't work that way. It's like, wow, I heard this prophetic word, so I'm going to give one. Make sure it's God. The point is having God's presence, not to have a manifestation. Sometimes it's when we... Um, we if we start getting into it so much that we draw the attention of others to us, that's where it becomes a distraction to the presence of God. You just have to ask yourself, am I, is what I'm doing inspiring people to look to the presence of God or have I got their attention for a while? Lastly, in part one of my sermon, Acts, 30, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Peter was preaching. This is the time when the Holy Spirit 
not only fill the Jews, but everyone else, Gentiles. That's why we have this blessing. And, and Peter was preaching to them. And he told them in verse 38 about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And how he went about doing good, healing all who are under the power of the devil because God was with him. Because God was with him. Because God was with him. It was God's presence on Jesus. It's God's presence on you. And when God's presence is here, he does good. He heals people physically. He frees people from demonic oppression and attack and temptation and torment. Because God is with you. God is filling this house. God is filling you. And God is spilling out into the community. And so God's going to send you and you'll do good and you'll pray for the sick and they'll be healed and you'll pray against the work of darkness and the a torment or suicidal thoughts in somebody and they'll lift because God is with you. It's the presence of God. Let's just pray for a moment. Thank you, God, for your love for us, your pursuit of us. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your choosing us to further your purpose. In the name of Jesus. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'd like to include some people in this prayer. And maybe you're here today and you have never made a decision to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And what I mean by that is not a childhood experience, not the prayers of a family member or friend, not just going to a church or praying a prayer. It's have you, is there a day that you said, I'm making the decision for myself to put my faith in Jesus. I want him to be my savior. I want him to be the Lord of my life. And you can do that today. It's a simple prayer with lifetime and eternal ramifications. Millions of people around the world have prayed a similar prayer, and I want to invite you, if you could be honest and say, you know, I, maybe you've never stepped in a church before, but maybe you have, but you say, I've never made that commitment. So I'm going to lead you in a 60-second prayer, and I want to invite you to pray this prayer with faith. And what I'm gonna do is ask everyone to repeat after me and pray this prayer, but I, I want you to pray those words with personal conviction. So I wanna invite everybody to pray this prayer. Say, dear God, thank you for Jesus. Come on, everybody, thank you for Jesus. I believe he's the son of God, that he died and rose again. I'm putting my faith in Jesus today, here and now. I want Jesus to be in my life. I want Jesus to forgive me of my sin and fill me with the Spirit of God. That's the prayer. That's the prayer that changes everything. And one last question here is, I, want, I just would like you to let me know. I wonder if there's anybody in this room who say, yeah, I, uh, Philip, I prayed that prayer out loud like you suggested, but for me, I wasn't just repeating it. I, I really meant that prayer. This was a decision for me the first time. I'm putting my faith in Jesus today. And I just would like to know that as the pastor here that you made that prayer and that decision. Would you just let me know by lifting your hand up real high wherever you are in the room, wherever you're seated, let me see. I see one, two, three, come on, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So I see some up there, 16, 17, maybe 20 people. You can put your hands down. God bless them, bless them and guide them. Let them sense your presence in this place. What we're going to do right now is now I'm going to invite the ushers to come and serve us communion. And so you guys can just come on up and start passing them out. And I'm going to ask everybody here in the room to do two things at once. Get a cup, pass it down the row, and pay attention to me. 
You can do that. I believe in you. It's like a miracle for some of you. Because I want to tell you about what we're doing here. Now, just so you know, everyone in the room is welcome to receive communion. You don't have to go to a class or pass a test or, you know, join the church. You're welcome to participate. But communion, it's important for us to know, is that it's more than a memorial. It's more than merely symbolic. The bread and the juice are not just emblems of the body and blood. Listen to this. Holy communion is a participation, a sharing and experiencing of Christ's blood and his body. Let me say that again. Holy communion is a participation, a personal participation in sharing and experiencing Christ's body and blood. Holy communion is not a meaningless ritual to be observed, but a blessing to be received. And so as we receive communion here in just a moment, I want you to recognize what Jesus did for you and experience the cleansing, experience the forgiveness experience the presence of God. Jesus told us in Matthew 26 when he was teaching the disciples this on the night he was going to be betrayed. He said he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He tells us do this in remembrance of me. So he took the bread and he took the wine and he blessed it and said this is me experience me and do this often. So this is not just a meaningless tradition, but a powerful moment that I invite you all to experience. Because when we do, we're proclaiming the Lord as our provider, as our savior, as our protector, as our healer. You know, in the Old Testament, when Moses was leading the people out of captivity when God said, okay, I'm going to destroy your enemies, and here's what I want you to do. Take the sacrificial lamb, which in our day is Jesus, but in that day was an actual lamb, to put the blood on the doorpost, the door frame of your home. And the judgment that's coming to your enemies will pass over you. And that's how we get Passover. And so he said, I have a blessing for my people. I have a blessing for provision, for wisdom, for health, for freedom. How many of you would prefer that the attacks of the enemy pass over your apartment, pass over where you live? Maybe you might even start receiving communion in your own home. Try it every day for a couple of weeks. You say, well, I'm struggling getting work. Well, unemployment can pass over your house and God will bring that blessing of, I'll bless everything they put their hand to, the work of their hands, Deuteronomy says. So this is a powerful moment, reassuring a moment, an exchange, bringing the presence of God into our home, into our, our dwelling and in this moment. Let's just take the cup in front of you, take the piece of bread out, the little wafer there. Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he blessed it. So God, we thank you for this bread and for what you taught us, the body of Jesus. And we thank you for giving your body for us, being a sacrifice. And I thank you that your word says that by your wounds on your body, we are healed. So we receive healing in this moment. We bless this and we receive it together in Jesus' name. Go ahead and eat that. We take this cup and we thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses us from all unrighteousness, causes us to be holy before God. It's the covenant that we are 
renewing our understanding and experiencing the blessing. So bless this as we receive it in Jesus' name. everything today for this moment right here here and now so the, the ushers are going to come and collect the cups not that moment but they're going to do that so it's not a distraction <laughs> and that way it'll just free up what's in your hands but now we're going to pray for healing because when God is with us he does good he brings healing he breaks the power of the enemy over our life. And so I'm going to pray for healing. And then we're going to worship God. And then we're going to see what God has done. And it's so easy on a day like this for us to pray. Be healed. God bless you. Have a great week. But I'd like to just test out and see what God might be doing. And that's what we, how we've been able to see his provision. But when we pray for healing... Sometimes God gives us a word of knowledge on that, that there's this condition that God wants to heal. And I want you to recognize that if you have that condition, recognize that as an opportunity to take a step higher in your faith. Like, well, I'm believing he's a healer and I would want healing. And then we say, God wants to heal somebody with a back problem. You're like, oh, he wants to heal me here and now because that's what I have. But you know, you don't need a word of wisdom necessarily because there is the written word. The, all that we've talked about today is an indicator. It's clear evidence of what God wants to do in your life. But what we're going to do is pray. Then we're going to worship God for a minute. And then we're going to find out. I'm going to ask you if, if you had some symptom of pain or some difficulty in your body and you feel like it's 50% less, I'm gonna ask you to go, that's happening with me. Because it honors God, it encourages others around you, and it encourages your faith. Because we don't wanna be focused, I still have pain. Because if you say, I still have pain, uh, it, it weakens your faith. Because it's like, when you came in, if the pain was an eight, and now it's a four, that's cool. That's good news. And it's, it's evidence of what God wants to complete it. So we just wanna be honest, we wanna be real, and we wanna see what God wants to do in your life. So now let me just read you a couple of scriptures. Isaiah 53, four, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. So Isaiah is saying, we looked at this guy being crucified and we thought, well, he's a criminal and he's getting what he deserved. But in reality, there was something else happening. And it says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds, we are healed. Throughout the scripture, salvation and forgiveness and healing go hand in hand with the love of God and his provision. Psalm 103, verse 2 and 3 says, Praise the Lord, my soul. Forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. That's what God is doing right now. When Jesus was ministering to a crowd of people, he preached the word, then he started praying for people. And Matthew described it as the reason Jesus was able to do this in that moment well, it was because of the promise we just read in Isaiah. So it says this, Matthew 8. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Today, let's welcome the presence of God. When I walked in here this morning before the first service, one of the guys serving as an usher came up to me randomly. He didn't know what I was going to talk about, but he said, hey, I just want to tell you I really appreciate you trusting God because on Easter Sunday, which was a long time ago, 
Um, I had so much pain in my feet. I had uh, plantar fasciitis, I guess is how you say it. And he said, I couldn't serve. I'd been in pain for a year and I was sitting up there and you said, God is healing somebody's feet up in the balcony. And he said, and you know what's amazing? Two days later, what had kept me down for a week, the pain was gone. So I want you to, I'm telling you that story so you don't miss something. He didn't say, I sat there and go, well, it still hurts, so I guess it wasn't for me. He said, you pray. I went, oh, wow, that could be me. And two days later, it was gone. So God has his way, his timing. And so we're going to pray, and we'll just let God do what he's going to do. But today, we've had people experience healing in their back, healing from arthritis, pain reduced dramatically in, in people's bodies in different ways. We've talked to people in the service and after. And I'm believing that God's going to do that right now. Father, let's stand to your feet. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would confirm your word and your promise. And I pray that people would be healed right now. I pray that the Holy Spirit would begin to move and touch people in a supernatural way. I declare we serve the God. We honor Jesus. We honor the Lord who forgives all of our sins and heals all of our diseases. And I pray for healing in the balcony on the left side over here. I pray that pain would be lifting off of them in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Lord. I pray for healing on the right side and down here. I pray for people that have need healing in their feet. Maybe there's a twisted ankle. Maybe there's a broken toe. Maybe somebody has that plantar fasciitis. We proclaim the name of Jesus, which is above every name, is above every sickness, is above every disease. Jesus Christ heals you here and now. I pray against cancer. I pray for the healing of back problems, spine, out of alignment, pinched nerves, sciatic nerve pain in the name of the Jesus. I pray for those who've been declared that have a disease, that the doctor said you have this condition, but I'm saying he heals all of our diseases and I ask the Holy Spirit to heal, that he would take healing in your lungs, in infected blood, blood disorders. I pray for healing in the stomach and digestive areas in the name of Jesus. Those who have some kind of growth or cyst or tumor, some kind of knot, maybe you can feel it, maybe it's on the inside and you can't, but place your hand over that place where uh, it would represent where that growth is right now. And I pray, Lord, touch them be removed and be cast into the sea. Cause what the enemy has begun to be washed away in the power of your blood. Bring healing in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. How many of you in this room say, I need healing of some kind in my body and in my emotions? Put your hand up. God, touch these people in the name of Jesus. And here's what I want you to do as we worship God right now. Anybody who wants prayer for healing, I want you to just make your way up to the front because some powerful things have been happening. You can step out now. Maybe you just want to have more of God's presence. If you're up in the balcony and you feel like you have faith for this moment, just don't walk down. We'll have room for you. Just give me a little room right here to walk by you so that I've got some space between you and the stage. And let's worship God. Holy Spirit, do your work in our bodies in Jesus' name. Trust him. Put your faith out there. Bless 
that God is opening somebody's ear. There's a lot, been a loss of either full hearing or partial hearing, and I just believe God is opening that ear, that eardrum, that injury, whatever it might be, in the name of Jesus. If somebody had an injury to their eye, and God is healing that, it's here and now being bringing healing in the name of Jesus. I pray that pain would lift in the name of the Lord. I pray against the power of darkness that would try to hold people captive. I pray that the spirit of pain would go in the name of Jesus. I pray for people with fibromyalgia, arthritis, bursitis. I pray that pain would go in the name of Jesus, that people would begin to recognize that the pain is reducing in intensity because of the presence of God. I thank you, Lord. Jesus Christ heals you. By his wounds, you are healed. I pray for unusual miracles in people's bodies. I pray for reproductive organs that have had some trauma be healed in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in us, oh God. Thank you, Lord. I pray for the spirit of infirmity, the spirit of fear to go. I pray against and I release you from the power of addiction. I pray for any addiction that is empowered by dark forces in your life. I free you in the authority of Jesus Christ. Eating disorders, I break that power and I pray the Holy Spirit will bring healing to your soul. In the name of Jesus, I pray against the depression that comes on you like a blanket of darkness, I break that power in the name of Jesus. I pray against the suicidal thoughts that torment and harass in the middle of the night that nobody knows about, but you struggle with it, but Jesus knows. And that is power is broken in the mighty name of Jesus. No name is greater than the name of Jesus. So I pray for healing of cancer in the balcony. I pray for healing in the name of the Lord. Let it be yours. Okay, everybody put your hands down for a moment. Let me ask this question. Is there anybody who had some pain or some condition when you came in and you can, whatever you rate it at is accurate. If it's an eight out of 10, fine. But now it's like a four. Something's happened, something's beginning to change. Pain is lessening, movement is happening. I wonder if you could just put your hand up real high and you're saying, I'm seeing some difference happen. Look at these hands, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Over here, some in the balcony up there. That's good, isn't it? Be happy for somebody. <laughs> I believe that's an indication that God wants to do more, that God's gonna bring more healing to you. Let's trust him. If you have a pain that was limiting your movement, I want you to just activate, do some, take an action. Like if it's a shoulder or an arm, move it around. Say in the name of Jesus, if it was a knee problem, just take a couple steps or move your ankle around, whatever it might be. If you got back pain, maybe bend over or uh, do what you would do normally that would cause pain and see if there's been any difference. This is not about 
um, making me feel like my prayer's working is about you recognizing that God's doing something in you. Who had their hand up here that said you saw something happening? Yeah? Um, can pain what? I have really bad anxiety and depression, so my body hurts so much. Yeah. Okay. A lot of anxiety and, and depression causing the body to tense up and get painful, and she's feeling peace, a lifting of that. That's great. Anybody else who's experiencing something? What, what's happening with you? Okay, wait, I want everybody to hear this. Can you say that one more time? I stabbed my Achilles tendon, and that was on Monday, and I had I still had, like, limited movement, um, and now I have a lot more movement, so. Let, let me see you move your foot. Yeah, is that, that's more freedom and flexibility? All right. Praise God for that. That's good. <laughs> Who else? Anybody experiencing something that's... That's the pain is going down. Did I see somebody over here raise your hand? What's happening with you? He had, he had arthritis in his neck and he had, couldn't move and have pain. Show me what, what he did. All right, that's good. That's great. Bless him, Lord. More and more of God's blessing. Anybody else? Anybody that didn't make it to the front, but you see something happening with you? Praise God. All right. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. God, let your power free people more fully. Is there anybody that had an a ear that where you had some uh, partial... Uh, could, yes? Yeah? Well, can you... Uh, let me just come down there. Can you guys give me a little room between the stage and you? No, like back up that way? There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can I just ask you real quick what happened? Uh, I had vertigo a long time ago, and I have hearing loss in this ear. And so now you can hear? It opened up? Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Wow. Praise God for that. That's good. Awesome. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you continue to complete that work and whatever else is connected to that. Vertigo. I pray that the healing of that ear would um, stabilize her balance and perspective. I pray that whatever happens in the brain communicating with the other side, I pray that that would be stabilized in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your healing in her life in the name of Jesus. Anybody up here with a, a shoulder or arm like arthritis or a, a bursitis of some kind, an injury that is looking for more healing, yeah? My wrist was, uh, like, my wrist was injured. I thought maybe the bone problem, and now totally healed. Yeah. Hold that up and move it around, let me see. All right, great. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. How many of you have anything with your hands, like, uh, pain, injury in your hands or fingers or numbness. We got, we got somebody over here too? Right here. Okay. And she cut the other one. Hmm? She cut the other one from the ear. It doesn't want to go away. It just came out. He mentioned the ear. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hang on one second. I'm going to pray for you. Let me see your hands. In the name of Jesus, touch these hands. Put your hands up like that. In the name of the Lord, I just pray for healing in these hands. And Lord, I pray that you would empower him to lay these hands on other people and not only be free from pain, but give healing to others because you said these signs would follow those who believe they would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. Who was the other person in here that said, in the name of the Lord, I pray for healing in these hands, healing for her, for her sake and healing for the sake of others in the name of Jesus that she would be a vessel uh, used by you as she goes out. She's part of the spilling out into the community, Lord. Empower her and anoint her with the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. 
I just feel like this is a moment here for the hands. In the name of Jesus, touch these hands. Is there pain in your hand right now? Not right now? What, uh, did you have pain when you came in? Numbness. I have a lot of stiffness. Okay. Okay. Numbness and stiffness, and it feels like arthritis, maybe? Okay. Thank you, Lord. By his wounds, we are healed. He heals all of our diseases. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus Christ. And I ask for healing and complete freedom. Where there's numbness, let that, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead gave new life. Let the Holy Spirit bring new life into numbness in her hands. There's, if there's numbness in your arms, or that's you? Okay. I pray, Lord, which arm? Both. Okay. And so, did you feel it in your shoulders or your or arms? It goes through my whole arm. Numbness. Okay. God, thank you for the touch of the Holy Spirit. I believe that that, that word of knowledge was to invite her into a place of faith. And I thank you, Lord, that what the enemy devised for evil, you're going to turn it to good. And I pray that there's healing, that there'll be uh, no more numbness, that it, she will be free in the name of the Lord. When you came in, did you have a little numbness in your arms? Yes. And what do you, do you tell me now, is it reduced a little bit? That I'm not feeling it right now. Yeah. Not feeling it at all? Okay. Numbness is a funny thing. It's like you can't feel, and then you go, I'm not feeling it. So it's, well, you, you are feeling. That's the cool thing, right? <laughs> Where's the other ones with hands here? In the name of Jesus, I believe that healing is in these hands. In the name of the Lord, let there be a gift released in her life. In the name of Jesus, what was the pain? Okay, carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay, so she didn't have pain now, but in the night, pain comes and she feels it. And so, God, I pray that you would do the work that only you can do and that this healing would last through the night. This healing would last in her life and that you would cause there to be a gift of faith in her life to pray for others. Let these hands be used of God. And where there is weariness and tension and stress on these hands, I pray, Lord, that you would heal. By his wounds, we are healed. And the peace of God in her life and throughout her muscles and hands in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise you, Lord. Let's just give God praise and worship. Oh, yeah. Okay, so there's a little knot, and yeah, it's, it's just there, away. and it's not going away. And so, Lord, we pray that you would touch her. I believe that that word came for growths and knots and whatever it might be. And so I pray that, Holy Spirit, that you would cause this knot to dissolve. Dissolve under the touch of our Lord Jesus by the blood of his body for us and say to that be removed and to be cast into the sea I pray that this will be a testimony a memory of faith that God cares that God touched this life be healed in the name of Jesus in the name of the Lord amen thank you Lord thank you God okay. <clears throat> so that is cool so I want you to learn to talk to people. Don't feel threatened if they go, I'm still feeling the same thing. Go, okay, let's pray again. And just interview them, lead them to a place. Let's pray some more, pray in the spirit. Know that God can use you. Especially if somebody says, I have this problem and it brings fear to you. Like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have asked. Step into that. Yeah. It's like, all right, let's pray. That's, not no, that's no big deal for God because it's not you, it's him, right? So I don't want to dismiss the service because then it won't spill out. So what I'm going to do is release you into public, all right? <laughs>